Thank you, Jason, and thanks everybody for being here this afternoon. I know you're very busy, um, and I really appreciate spending time with me today to discuss this topic. So briefly, before we move forward, I'd like to discuss our agenda for the webinar today. Uh, first, I'll start by providing a little bit of background information for you, just to provide context uh, regarding the importance of using academic assessment data to inform student affairs practices, which is the focus of the webinar today. Now, I know that some of you may already be doing some of these things, uh, but I hope our discussion today will provide additional information that will allow you to expand your process or perhaps provide additional ideas for you. So we'll discuss um, why this partnership is important to our internal stakeholders, as well as our relationship with external stakeholders. So that will be a focus of this presentation as well. I'll next provide a brief summary of the structure of our curriculum here, uh, just to provide again a little bit more context to our school and our assessment practices here to help you understand uh, the data that I'll share with you today. Next, I'll move into discussing briefly how we track student performance data. I think it's important uh, for you to understand that in order to understand what I share with you about how we use the data to inform our practice and our strategies to share this information with our student affairs colleagues. After that, I'll then uncover the specifics of how we use this data to inform those practices really in three main areas of focus today. And those three areas are advising, remediation, and enrollment management or admissions, depending on your institution. I know that we um, interchange enrollment management and admissions quite frequently. And then lastly, I'll share with you the outcomes of these practices. So at my institution, as well as in higher education broadly, what are the outcomes of this? And I'll share with you the changes that we have made here as a result of these discussions and communication with our student affairs colleagues here. And then of course, we'll end the presentation with a Q&A session and then hopefully some open discussion. Um, I do want to say before we begin, you're certainly welcome to contact me offline later if you have any questions or if you'd like to collaborate. Um, I certainly would enjoy chatting with you about this at a later time. But for now, we'll go ahead and just move on with the presentation. So just to provide a little bit of background and context for this information before we move forward, I really think as institutions of higher education face increasing pressure from accrediting bodies, which I know we're all feeling and you're likely feeling that as well, it's really imperative for us to show evidence of how we use our data to inform and modify practices on the academic side, which we all do pretty well, um, but also that student affairs side. I do think most institutions, just speaking from my experience, uh, most institutions are very transparent about using our academic data to inform the curriculum and our course delivery mechanisms, but we really also need to show how we're connecting that with our student affairs initiatives because that holistic educational experience for the student is of utmost importance. And I think that's really the perspective of accreditors, right? They're looking sort of holistically at the students um, from both ends and looking at who we graduate and what our students look like when they enter practice. And I think particularly in an environment like mine, in a high stakes environment such as medicine um, or any other field such as pharmacy, et cetera, when students are preparing to pass a, license, a licensure exam, I think that becomes even more important. And historically, I think we've really struggled in higher education to connect these pieces, to connect the academic side um, and the student affairs side in meaningful ways. And again, I'm speaking from my own experience in the institutions that I've been a part of you know, currently, as well as conversations I've had with colleagues, uh, both locally and nationally at conferences. I think oftentimes student affairs representatives aren't really informed of academic performance data unless major concerns arise with a student. And unfortunately, at that point, it can be a little bit too late. Um, so we've made some strides here to address this issue and create a consistent data sharing relationship. Um, and to me, it almost feels like the important last piece of the puzzle. So that's the, the icon I provided there because for academic affairs professionals like myself and perhaps for faculty as well, student affairs might look a little bit different or feel a little bit different because we don't have interactions uh, with that group as often as, as we like. 
Um, and so all these pieces just really have to fit together into this holistic piece and the, the student experience. And, and when I refer to this today, I am talking about partnerships, student affairs, and academic affairs and what we can do um, from our end, but also I think it's important that we be transparent about these procedures with students um, because ultimately they need to see and understand how all components of their education work together as well. So before we move forward, I have mentioned that I've discussed this with national colleagues. I did present this information at a recent conference. Um, and had some really great conversations with national colleagues about what we can do at a higher level in higher education to really continue to bridge this gap. So I'm going to tell you about the strides that we've made here to bridge this gap, and I hope we can continue to develop our process further, as well as discuss with you um, some ideas through our discussion today. So just to tell you a little bit about our curriculum before we move forward, because I think this is important to understand the nature of our assessment structure. Our integrated curriculum was really designed around core competencies as the ultimate goal, um, of course, to ensure that we're graduating competent practitioners at the end of the curriculum. And the nature of our curriculum is that we have systems-based courses, uh, such as the pulmonary system, the renal system, cardiovascular, endocrine, etc. So they really focus on a body system. Because of that nature, all of our courses have a course director that's in charge of planning that curriculum, but it also includes multiple lecturers and multiple external clinicians um, that are considered to be experts in the field. So courses, teaching methods, any assessments that we do, as well as our student support to serve, <clears throat> excuse me, services that we'll talk about today, all of that is built around competency-based education. Our assessments are embedded, uh, so we have written examinations as well as formative quizzes that are written. And then we also have more hands-on, practical-type exams. Those are clinically oriented, um, and those are also in ExamSoft, so we can attempt to determine relationships between those two pieces, between the written components as well as those hands-on practical exams and look at those relationships in those data to try to prepare students for practice. So why am I telling you all this? Um, the reason that this is all important is because of the nature of that integrated curriculum, we have to be able to track um, categories of student assessments and different sets of data to attempt to determine relationships between student performance and other variables in the educational experience. So that becomes more important in a systems type curriculum like ours. So how do we track this data? I'm going to share with you examples of tracking written exams as well as a rubric that we use to track some of that practical data I just described. So we'll start with the written end. All of our written exam questions and rubric dimensions are mapped to learning outcomes and competencies um, that I've already discussed, but I've provided a few examples here on this slide for you. Um, we can categorize even one written exam question to, let's say, system, discipline, learning domain, and competency, which are the four examples that I've provided here for you in this slide. But we really can develop any sort of category structure to measure whatever we would choose to measure. And what this allows me to do as the ultimate goal is I can develop student performance reports and manipulate our data to investigate how students are performing really in uh, multiple areas in our curriculum. So I could look at one of these categories or I could combine this data to look at how some of these categories cross over, which becomes very important in our systems-based curriculum. And importantly, it also allows our course direct directors to measure whatever they would like to measure. Um, that really helps interest in assessment, and it, of course, supports academic freedom. Um, most, just to give you some examples, most of our course directors are interested in measuring things like um, lecture objectives. So if we look at one lecture objective, how did students perform on average on one objective versus another? Um, and then also they like to look at student performance based on a specific faculty lecturer. Because we have so many external clinical lecturers and so many, I guess we can say, hands in the fire um, in the course, course directors do like to track that over time, and that way we can determine if students are understanding and comprehending and applying knowledge 
from that specific area or that specific instructor, um, or in this case, as you'll see on the screen, all of these four components, the discipline, system, learning domains, and then the NBOME piece on the far left, that is what we use as our core competencies that was developed by our accrediting body as our main competency areas. So these are examples of our categories that I have placed here, but certainly if these specific categories wouldn't apply to your learning outcomes and what you intend to measure, you can develop the categories that you wish in order to track what would be most meaningful for you and for your faculty in order to take a look at your curriculum um, in your department or your school or your institution, depending upon uh, the role that you play and what your assessment efforts are. So now I'm going to move forward and show you an example of how we do this in rubric format. I wanted to show you this example because this is what you'll see here is an example of a rubric in our Intro to Clinical Medicine course. I know it might be a little bit difficult to read, um, but really what is in all of these smaller boxes isn't as important as what you'll see in the categories there. You can see that we track the same exact categories that we do in our written exams, and that's really important. Um, this example of this assessment is a small group assessment. So we know we're School of Medicine, so we know that doctors must interact in interprofessional groups eventually in practice. And so we really want to gauge interaction skills and group interaction skills with our students now so that we can provide feedback to them, or our faculty rather, provide that feedback so that they can improve on those skills should they need to before they enter clinical practice. So the reason we use the same categories is so I can track and pull reports over time to compare how students are doing in written assessments versus how they're doing in these hands-on practical type assessments. We can look at data and trends in that data over time. So that's a really important piece in discussing why we use the categories the way we do, um, as I just showed you on the, the previous slide, but I wanted to make sure I show how it's related to our practical and our rubric dimensions. So how do we use all this data? Because this does produce quite a bit of data uh, that we can manipulate in, in very different ways. So what I'm going to show you on, on the next slides, I pull all this information into um, student performance reports and exam level reports. And that really provides detailed information that becomes key to show individual performance averages as well as class averages in all of these outcomes er outcome areas. This can help students identify um, areas of improvement, and they can work with their advisors for that. That's something they can do independently as well. Um, but most importantly, this data that we collect from these categories, it's really shared with, with four main players, with students individually, and I'll show you an example of that report and how that can be used for advising and remediation. It's shared with faculty advisors. It's shared with the chair of our Student Promotion and Academic Progress Committee, and I'll tell you how that comes into play in just a moment. But we also share this data with our Assistant Dean of Student Affairs, and we share this data with our Director of Admissions. I know to some of you that might sound like a lot of key individuals having access to data reports, but as we move through the presentation, I'll explain to you why that's really important, because those are really our key stakeholders um, in student affairs and that therein lies that relationship and that communication and collaboration. Most importantly to this, it really supports early intervention for students who might be at risk. And that process that I mentioned earlier of it often being too late when student affairs professionals are pulled in, this mechanism really avoids that from happening in our situation, this data sharing relationship. So we're going to talk about, again, three main areas. I'll start with advising, remediation, and I do want to say those are very highly connected. Advising and remediation are highly connected, but they're a little bit separate, so I'll cover them separately, um, and then enrollment management. So if we take a look first at advising, that's what you'll see here on this slide. Um, I do want to start out by saying I know that depending on your institution or your school, advising structures look very different. Um, sometimes it's a responsibility of staff advisors. At other institutions, I know sometimes it's only faculty, and still at others, it can be a combination of faculty advising as well as staff support for advising. So before we move forward, I do want to say I think regardless of your model, 
that you use at your institution, you could adapt what we discussed today in any way that it might work for you. To tell you a little bit about our structure, technically our advising is faculty-based, uh, so students are assigned to a faculty advisor at the point of entry but students might need referred to additional support services or need that support from staff in student affairs. So that might involve our student affairs staff as well as our campus level staff, since we're a school within a campus. So in some cases, our academic advising support is really a joint effort between faculty and our staff advisors and student affairs. So the way that we structure this at our school is at the beginning of each academic year, as I've shared, students are um, set up with an advisor when they come in. And all advisors receive a report of very early academic information for their advisees. And that's all based on admissions data. So that includes things like their um, undergraduate GPA, their science GPA, MCAT score, um, major, we also conduct interviews as part of the admissions process, so those scores are also included in that preliminary report. So they get that at the point of entry. And that becomes very important because that allows advisors to identify early on students that they might consider to be at risk. And this isn't a formalized process, that advisor doesn't need to technically report that to anyone. Um, or anything like that, but it does facilitate that communication and it makes them aware of students that might need a little bit of extra push or a little bit of extra support at the point of entry so that early intervention can occur with those individuals. Now students and advisors also receive timely exam feedback and that's the example of what I provided uh, here on this slide. This is a Strengths and Improvement Opportunities Report. This is just a sample of an exam and what this might look like for a student. Um, the left side here, this icon on the left, that includes our category coding and student performance in those categories based on disciplines. I wanted to share that one since that's one of the category structures that I shared with you previously. And then what you'll see on the right side that would be something that the course director chose to uh, track within his or her course. So those are actual uh, lecture titles that that individual chose to track. So in addition to the things like system, discipline, competency that we've already discussed a little bit, they also get these objectives or in this case, lecture titles. Now something I do want to point out about this report, you'll see some areas in which there may be three exam items in a particular uh, category or two you'll see in some cases. So this is a helpful report for advisors to sit down with their students and it's helpful for students to see where they might have some areas in which they can improve. But this report is a little limited if you don't have a high number of exam items coded to a specific category. So this is used for that purpose, however, so this provides a snapshot, I would say. That's how I would sort of label it. It's a snapshot of one exam, and then what I'll show you next related to remediation is an overall summary report of data that we pull. So the larger data reports are used for advising, but also for remediation, so that's why I've included that larger report on this next slide that I'm getting ready to show you. So this is advising. And then this slide will talk about remediation in a little bit greater detail. So in addition to the strengths and improvement opportunities report that I just showed you, we also send an expanded report that provides a view of a student's full record from the beginning of the time that they started here. So rather than this being at the exam level like the previous report, this is actually a student performance summary. And so I'm differentiating between those two. So faculty advisors are still involved in this, so this is still part of advising. Faculty advisors receive these reports, um, and this is just a snippet sample here, but they receive pretty large reports that flag at-risk students who will be required to remediate one course or multiple courses. And they get these after each exam. So these reports include exam data as well as overall summary data from final grades for courses. So this gives more of a comprehensive view. And these as well are sent to relief four main stakeholders who use this data in different ways. I mentioned advisors already, 
but this is where the Student Promotions Committee becomes involved, our Student Promotion and Academic Progress Committee. And also this report with a full summary goes to Student Affairs and to Admissions, and we'll talk about admissions in just a moment. Any course failure we have has to be reviewed by our Student Promotions Committee. And I think it's really important to note the individuals that comprise that committee. So that committee includes faculty, of course, um, but it also includes the Assistant Dean of Student Affairs on that committee to serve as an advocate for students. So that's a reason that that individual needs to understand this data. And then I also sit on that committee as Director of Assessment. Now, when this committee meets, often students are referred to additional support services within Student Affairs. So that's another reason it's important for this individual to be a part of this committee and also to see this data. And something else I'd like to point out that has come out as a result of this, um, sharing this type of data with our Student Affairs um, practitioners, it also allows us to identify patterns in student behavior that perhaps wouldn't have been noticed had we not developed this communication and this collaborative relationship. And this example I'm going to share with you is a real example um, as an outcome that has come out of this. Let's say we have a student who is struggling academically and we're starting to notice some academic struggle patterns here. Um, but really we find out from student affairs that this student is involved in seven or eight clubs or student groups. So this is an example in which the faculty advisor may not have known that the student was as heavily involved in, in great things, in great groups and things like that, um, but that faculty advisor may not have known that. The faculty advisor probably would only know about the academic data. And similarly, student affairs may not have known about the academic side if we hadn't created this data sharing relationship. So in this example, and again, these are real examples, these students that we recognize these patterns in are very capable of strong academic performance, but what is happening is they're becoming overly involved um, in student groups or social organizations, which are very worthy. But in these cases, Student Affairs is able to intervene with these students and talk to them about priorities, uh, time management strategies, et cetera. And since these reports come out after each exam, that then is early intervention to intervene with these students prior to an actual failure of a course, you can intervene in time to provide services or support for those students to help them with that time management. And typically in these cases, we have seen as students pare down what they're involved in in the club and organization level, the academic performance improves. So that's just one example of something we've recognized, um, that behavior pattern that through this data sharing relationship, we're able to uncover some of those things um, and actually apply data to this rather than just sometimes these conversations that just tend to happen in hallways and things like that. So those behaviors have become evident as well. So now I'd like to move on to enrollment management or admissions. And I would say this is the area in which um, we really have communicated with our, our student affairs and admissions folks in very meaningful ways. And we have a lot of results that have come of this. So just to tell you a little bit about that data sharing relationship here, um, at the conclusion of each academic year, that data, as I've mentioned, is shared with admissions. But something I do in my role is I correlate academic performance data with admissions data. I do that at the class level, and I do that at the individual level for students. So what I do is I analyze the data based on many admissions factors, which I, I mentioned some of that in the previous slide on advising and what we provide uh, to advisors, but those are the basic things again, like GPA, science GPA, MCAT, MCAT score, how they do on interviews, that tries to capture a little bit of that, that social aspect. And I look at these factors and I attempt to um, run correlations. I want to determine, is there a correlation between specific variables and student performance in a given course or across the curriculum. So what this does, this statistical analysis reveals relationships between that baseline admissions data and future academic performance. When I run these correlations, I do share it with our faculty because none of it is name linked, so I share it pretty widely with faculty as well as the director of admissions. And the director of admissions really uses this data to modify 
our admissions metrics if relationships are found, and so then we adapt our admissions policies accordingly, according to this data and relationships that arise. And out of this practice, pulling this academic performance data from ExamSoft and also the grading components and looking at admissions practices, it has actually um, changed what our admission standards are over time. So as a result of this analysis, changes have occurred. Um, currently, I use the data from the written and practical exams. We have not started our clerkships yet. That will be something when our students go out into their clinical rotations. Um, that happens in year three and four here. Um, when they actually go out and they get graded on site, I will look at that data as well because my assumption is different types of patterns in performance versus um, admissions data, different things will be uncovered, different data relationships. Of course, as an assessment professional, I have to add a word of caution. Um, though I do run these correlations, of course, if patterns or things are uncovered here, we know that that won't hold true for every student. So I do have to add caution that though this provides additional information for us and we have seen some patterns uncovered and relationships that have been revealed, I always have to insert that word of caution here and be careful on the interpretation of this data. Importantly, the results that come from this type of analysis also eventually will loop back to our advising practices. Um, and what I mean by that is, is I've talked about at-risk indicators quite a bit today and how we intend to allow advisors to identify at-risk students really at the point of entry. Um, and this is really an outcome, but I'll go ahead and share it with you now, a result of, of using some of this data. We're really still attempting to determine what, what is at risk. What are those specific identifiers? What are those indicators? Um, what is it that we need to be looking for? We have a sense of what some of those are uh, through, that, through this relationship of this data, but we'll attempt to uncover that in greater detail and further develop that in the future. Because what we really want to do is formalize this data in the future based on this analysis. We really want to provide specific interventions for students who are determined to be at risk based on what comes out of this analysis. So for example, uh, one of the outcomes of this, what we've discussed is some of those interventions might be um, helping students identify learning style preferences in order to support their study skills or something else we've talked about is for those students who might be identified at risk, is there something that could be offered for them in the form of a workshop related to our reading and analyzing a research study? Um, are there things that we can do if we notice something in the interview skills? Are there things that we can do as far as intervention to make a student more comfortable uh, speaking to people or presenting, those types of things? So those are some of the interventions that we've discussed. These at-risk indicators can really help us further support those individuals and importantly identify them early and intervene early with those students who might benefit most from this type of intervention. So that's a result in enrollment management and a point of entry, um, what we've been able to do and what we've been able to find through the analysis of some of these relationships. So moving on a little bit with the outcomes, I've shared with you um, that we've modified our admission standards. So we have looked at this academic performance data and through sharing with student affairs and admissions, we have determined that we needed to change some of our admissions thresholds and that has occurred. Um, and again, that the early intervention technique that I just shared with you, some of these pieces that we in programming, you might refer to it as programming, that we intend to implement um, for these students who might be at risk of eventual failure. I think ultimately um, the partnership between academic affairs and student affairs here, it really goes back to that holistic educational experience that we discussed at the beginning as a really important factor. I think it's definitely through this collaborative relationship our students certainly understand why it is that we're sharing that data. We're very transparent about it. Um, and they understand the importance of this relationship because they know it focuses really on uh, student success as the ultimate goal, that it really benefits them um, in the ultimate, in the long run. What we've found through this is oftentimes, and this seems fairly obvious, but what we've done really provides the data to support it. 
we know, right, that academic performance is often connected to aspects, additional aspects of a student's educational experience. I mean, we know that students don't leave their personal lives behind when they, when they enter our doors to attend class. But through this process, what we found is that students who have academic challenges often experience difficulties in other aspects of their lives as well. So this communication relationship with student affairs is very important because these students typically need additional support services. Things that we have included previously as a result of this, of course, uh, referrals to things like tutoring, uh, additional counseling perhaps, depending on the situation. We've created a mentoring program, our, our upper level students uh, with our incoming students, just to mentor them um, and sort of guide the way, whether it be studying or with personal development, uh, things like that, as well as students who possibly need um, additional testing accommodations that perhaps they had never needed before, but due to the different nature of the curriculum here versus what they may have experienced in the past, they might need those additional uh, accommodations or support through student services and through student affairs. So really that importance of considering academic affairs and student affairs as two components, but pieces of the puzzle, um, really working together to support a student's holistic academic journey and trying to identify those at-risk indicators that, that might potentially uh, lead to challenges down the road. And importantly, uh, cultivating and strengthening relationships with stakeholders. Of course, that supports really engaging with students on a deeper, more meaningful level. When we are all communicating, we can do our jobs better and we can better support students. Um, and accrediting bodies are certainly important uh, since we started the presentation there. That's certainly important that we provide this evidence. But I think, of course, our ultimate goal is ensuring that we um, graduate competent, successful uh, students who will enter the field um, and that they will have a positive experience with us. So those are really the main outcomes um, that I've shared with you. And at this time, I'd really just like to open it up for questions or any suggestions you may have. If you'd like to share what you're doing in this regard um, and discuss it, I'd certainly be open to that as well. So are there any questions today? Thank you so much. We have received a couple of questions. Okay. The first is, can you describe um, the the longer term imp or the imagined longer term impact uh, of this process using your assessment data for admissions? Yeah, I think um, certainly if we think long term about where this will go specific to admissions, I think we will continue to refine our admissions process. Um, and that's something that is occurring in real time. So as we discover some of these data relationships, that's occurring for the next year. Uh, but sometimes that's hard to do due to the nature of how often we're interviewing students and what our actual admissions trajectory looks like. Um, but each time these relationships are uncovered, it's shared with um, the director of admissions as well as the admissions committee. So these individuals do come together to discuss these data relationships and these correlations and impact our admissions practices uh, for the future. So as we continue to refine it, we will continue to adapt and really modify what our standards are over time. So that will continue to evolve and change with time, but the end result is really modifying who we allow to come in depending on what these relationships uncover. Thank you. Can you describe how ExamSoft affected your assessment philosophy? Yeah, I think that it's affected it in, in many ways. Um, but primarily, I would say what this does for us as assessment professionals and working with faculty is it provides evidence on multiple levels. Uh, that faculty can use to, again, that piece I talked about of um, faculty being able to measure what they want to measure within their courses, within their embedded assessments. 
I think it provides evidence that we think is important for accreditation and for curricular review and things like that. But I think importantly, that philosophy of this culture of evidence as a whole place, so as a whole unit, an institutional unit, we really can develop that culture based on all of this data and the output that we can pull from this. I think also an important piece of that is that it has helped us with, I think a lot of times assessment can feel like an extra piece or something extra to do for people. And I think importantly, when it's embedded through ExamSoft, when we're measuring outcomes through ExamSoft in real time, as students are taking exams, it doesn't feel like something extra. It feels like something that's part of the pedagogical process. It's part of teaching. It's just something that's inherent in teaching and learning. And so ExamSoft allows us to pull that data and use that data as evidence in order to support that, that it's part of the teaching process. It's not extra. It's just something we do as faculty, as administrators, as staff, it just part, is part of the teaching and learning process. Thank you. Can you discuss what implementation was like? Of which piece? Uh, of the platform and then implementation of the process. Uh, so of ExamSoft in general and yes. then of these other processes. Okay. So implementation for us we actually were only two years old, and that's an important piece to discuss as far as implementation. Um, it started with faculty and administrators sitting together and planning together and determining what are these categories that we want to develop? What's the most important thing for us to measure? So we came away with those five high-level categories that everyone is expected to categorize to. So that would be our competency, discipline, system, uh, learning domain that I've shared with you, and then also some administrative categories like faculty and things like that. But also what came out of that is we want people to be able to measure what they want to measure. So that came that piece of course specific categories and, and faculty can determine if they are course directors they can determine what they want to measure within those courses. So our exams, we are also iPad exclusive, which is important to note. So all of our exams are electronic, everything is handled through the iPad, and we can quickly pull data since we have all of that electronic data and our rubrics are also in there, which is a huge piece. We don't have any more written practical data. Originally, we had some written practical data that we then had to translate into the system which wasn't very fun to do, but we needed the data in one house. So we did that so that we can pull some of these relationships. So it went fairly smoothly after those initial discussions of what we wanted to develop as our category structure. Now these other components of admissions and advising and remediation, those have sort of revolved over time. We did some of that at a baseline level uh, when we began, <clears throat> excuse me, when we began. But as we've realized what faculty want to see and what we need in order to improve our curriculum and in order to improve our processes, we've really honed in and improved those over time. So for example, in the admissions analysis, we were looking at maybe two key variables to start. And now that has turned into, let's look at variables individually, but now we want to start to look at some multivariate analysis because we know some of these variables overlap. Um, so as far as rolling that out, that has changed pretty rapidly over time. I think what's important to note is it's been very uh, rewarding for me to see as you start to provide some of this data, people will start to ask additional questions about the data. So you provide some of this and then you start getting questions of, oh, but I really want to know how this is related to this and, and what else might you be able to provide that would help me answer these specific questions. Um, so that has evolved in itself as well. The data are sort of speaking for themselves because people will see that and then they'll just want to know more. So then we provide more data and this evolves over time and it's really just a cycle of us looking at um, measurement. Excellent. 
Thank you. The next question is, will you be using the NBME subject examinations for the clerkships? And if so, how will you incorporate these data? At the moment, we do not have uh, plans to use. So when students are out in clerkships, they will take a COMAT exam uh, for that specific content area. Um, and that measures their uh, competency, their knowledge, their application in that specific content. Um, but that really is what we intend to use as a measure of a student's knowledge in that area. And then they will be evaluated by their preceptor on site on that specific clinical rotation as well. So we will combine those two pieces of data to evaluate students in that regard. Excellent. Thank you. We will pause for a moment and see if there are any additional questions. Do you have any final remarks you'd like to make, Dr. Zoll? I just want to say thanks to everybody for participating to, again today. And I just want to reiterate um, my information is here. If you'd like to contact me with any additional questions that you think of later, um, that would be perfectly fine with me. So thanks so much for attending the webinar today. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Zoll, for sharing your time and expertise with us today. We do appreciate you taking the time out of your afternoon to share uh, your experience with the platform as well as with the as well as the inclusion of um, this data for uses beyond academic affairs and using this data for student affairs. I would like to take a moment to remind um, all attendees about our upcoming uh, exam soft assessment conference. This is being held at, in Lexington, Kentucky from June 3, uh, June 3rd to the 4th uh, in uh, immediately after the uh, conference with the AAHLE. We would also like to remind everyone that at the conclusion of today's webinar, you will have an opportunity to participate in the seven question survey. We encourage everyone to complete the survey so we may continue to provide relevant content in all of our presentations. Those who do complete the survey will be entered into a drawing for a $25 gift card to Amazon.com. Additionally, we would also like to remind everyone of our upcoming webinar presented by Dr. Ronald Caravo and Dr. Mike Simmons entitled, If You Can't Measure and Report It, You Can't Improve It. This is scheduled for Wednesday, April 15th from 2 to 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. This concludes today's presentation. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time and attention. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Zoll, again, for sharing your expertise with us. We appreciate your, uh, we appreciate your, your, your expertise, and thank you very much. Thank you.